All right. Well, I think we'll get started. And those that uh, log in can catch up. Everybody's becoming such a, a pro with, uh, with Zoom these days. So I'm sure they'll figure it out if they didn't get the instructions up front. Uh, my name is Jim Frazier. I'm a business development manager here at Cordev. Um, just going to kind of tell you what the uh, what the housekeeping looks like uh, today, and then I will turn it over uh, to a couple of other folks. So during the presentation, everybody will be on mute. Uh, so please hold your questions and comments until the end. Uh, at the end, you have multiple ways to play. So if you would like to uh, type your question into Q&A, that's great. Uh, if you want to go to chat, that's fine too. We will be monitoring both of those. Uh, or you can just raise your hand and then we will take you off of mute, but that will not be until the end of the presentation. So you jot down your notes and uh, we will make sure that we get to everybody and then we can open it up if there are additional questions uh, after the fact. So as we get started, I'd like to introduce John Bach, who is a Cordell alum. Uh, he's a former uh, QA SIG host and a QA SIG program manager. So he is uh, well versed uh, in our QA SIGs. And uh, let me hand it over to you, John. Thank you, Jim. Uh, some of you know me. Uh, I uh, did a talk last year, November, at the QA SIG about. Uh, moving from the quality engineering world as a tester and a test manager, a test director uh, at eBay, when this is the background behind me. This is our 25th anniversary this year, started in 1995. Uh, and the talk was about going from that quality world to being a program manager. And uh, I think there's the recording still up on the site, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> so check that out if you're curious. Uh, and I think in that recording, you will hear me make uh, an offhand joke about starting uh, a PM SIG. And uh, I think Jacob was one of the ones who, who uh, held me to that and said, you really should do that. That's a, that's a cool idea. And I said, yeah, maybe someday. And I was talking to Shelly uh, and Krista from Cordev, my old colleagues, and uh, they agreed to sponsor it. So I thought, okay. What would that be like? So next month in October and every even month, so opposite P, uh, QA SIG, there will be a PM SIG. And the PM stands for either program manager or product manager or project manager, either one. But the spirit is what are the issues around that kind of management in software development? And I'm pleased to announce that the second Wednesday in October will be our first PM SIG. Uh, sponsored by Corda. Um, I will uh, not be the speaker. I'll just be the host like, like Joe is for QA6. But we do have a speaker named Margaret Kenrick uh, with NanoString. And her talk will be titled Facilitating Strategic Planning and in Industry Through Strengths-Based Leadership. And she's going to talk about the challenges in facilitating strategic planning for, for teams and processes and applications of appreciative inquiry, which, uh, which is a form of... Um, asking questions in a, in a productive uh, way to get more information about something, uh, to identify a team's strengths. And she's going to be talking about launching and executing um, uh, in a way that celebrates wins and embracing challenges. So very pleased to announce that. I hope you'll join us in October. Uh, stay tuned for more details from uh, Shelly, Krista, and Jim uh, about that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, uh, I will hand it over to uh, Joe uh, for some remarks. Thanks, John. I'm so excited about this, and thanks for taking that on. And it's it's such a privilege to watch the evolution of your career and also the evolution of the career of our speaker tonight, Jacob Stevens, who was has been a longtime member of the Cordov team, but has changed uh, courses recently, and he's focusing on uh, you know the changing role of testing in artificial intelligence, you've all seen the title, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and quantum computing. And I'm really excited to hear this talk. Um, so uh, rather than ramble on, I'll turn it over to you, Jacob. 
Cheers. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Um, and, and seriously, uh, sincere thanks and, and gratitude to the Core Dev team, to Shelley, uh, to Park Blake, and to uh, Chris Lindley that um, set me up with the, um, the last role over the past uh, year that I was able to um, uh, work on that really set up the platform for me to, to share. This is basically just some lessons learned. Um, this is kind of a new direction for um, our industry, kind of some pioneering stuff. I'm really grateful to be a part of um, some of the early adoption that uh, this work has gone on. And so I'm just really grateful to um, share it. And uh, it's, it's a great opportunity. So um, I definitely hope everybody can uh, breathe okay. I've been watching the fires, especially in Oregon, but they're, they're in Washington. And of course, California seems like it's always on fire. Um, I just moved from Seattle. I'm now down in Jupiter, Florida. Uh, and so, but I've been watching from the other side of the nation. I, I, I see the orange skies and, and everything. It's really kind of apocalyptic. So um, I presume that the majority of us are probably still in the Seattle area. So um, I hope everyone is doing well. Um, and so, uh, yeah, let me share my screen and we'll get going. I actually am kind of cheating a little bit. I um, have a couple of videos to share. I'm going to start with one that really does a better job of explaining the project that I got to work on um, from last year until uh, just wrapped up um, last month and um, and then we'll kind of take it from there. And so um, I've got uh, combined uh, like seven minutes worth of videos. So hopefully that'll be a little bit more interesting than, than me just rambling on. So um, I'll give this a shot. Uh, please let me know. Hopefully um, you guys will be able to hear this. And if not, that they'll be able to um, notify me. Um, okay, so my screen is shared and I'm gonna play uh, video number one. Let's go. Over many decades, the shipping container shrank the world. Big data coupled with new technologies are further shrinking our world and accelerating business. Phoenix Marine Services and Savantex are making this a reality at Pier 300 at the Port of Los Angeles by delivering on a massive transformation across a complex network. In 2019, Phoenix set the cornerstone by deploying the latest generation of iron and accelerating throughput, the brawn. Bigger and faster, but still held back by legacy technologies and operations. The new decade ushers in the brains. 2020 marks the year when the Hone Optimization Engine connects the industry through integration services for increased and predictable cargo flows. These services rely upon accurate and up-to-date terminal data and systems connectivity through APIs, so customers can plan and change their plans at the click of a button. The Phoenix Savant X Hone engine consists of a suite of patented machine learning and advanced analytics technologies that intelligently orchestrate port operations, intelligence that cannot be replicated elsewhere through siloed data or reverse engineering. To validate this symphony of brawn and brains, key performance areas drove the creation of a Pier 300 digital twin. Referencing the digital twin baseline plus many data feeds, the Hone engine continuously predicts and optimizes operations. To achieve this new level of understanding and optimization, Hone draws upon a new type of computing. Just as the shipping container shrunk the world, quantum computing is shrinking the physics of computing to solve previously unsolvable problems. Leveraging a D-Wave systems quantum computer, the Hone engine delivers one of the first practical quantum applications. The box may be black, but it is not a black box. The science behind the Hone engine brings transparency and understanding to key operations. The brawn, coupled with such deep understanding and optimization, scales this massive transformation across all operations. Phoenix Marine Services and Savantex, creating a new industry standard for highly efficient, predictable, and customer controllable shipments. Supply chain intelligence. Intelligence outside the box.
Ta-da! Okay, I think it's the first uh, video. Definitely don't want this to start a second time. Um, so hopefully everybody was able to hear that and get that. Um, it was such a cool project. I really uh, loved it, really enjoyed it a lot. And um, that's kind of the predicate for this evening. Um, my hope is to kind of help to kind of demystify some of this stuff. Even now, it's a little bit difficult to fully wrap my mind around everything that um, these new technologies really kind of, what the implications are and everything is fairly complex stuff, um, but the, it can be deconstructed. And so I think it probably shouldn't be as intimidating as it might be. So that's kind of my hope, my, my goal that I hope I can achieve with uh, some of you. If you're not familiar with it, there's a chance that you probably already are somewhat uh, familiar with this and, and some of this uh, uh, explanation that I'm doing is not going to help you at all. But I'm also bringing basically what my lesson learned is really kind of have distilled it down to a central thesis that um, I see as really kind of the role of testing and, and quality moving forward by no mean is that is that going to uh, eliminate all the other industries that we have in software and in and tech and um, and certainly in quality assurance um, it's just a new um, field it's a new pioneering uh, uh, you know it's it's greenfield i guess is the right term and um, uh, but there's not a lot of uh, competition we're definitely going to need a lot more talent um, in this section and so um, that's kind of my, uh, uh, my hope for it. So let me get this into presentation mode and I'll kind of get going. Cordev slide deck. And so here's, uh, my quick explainer. Um, you might've already seen something like this and seen this referenced. Um, <laughs> I wish it was, funnier uh i'm not a very funny guy so i had to kind of steal this um kind of inject a little bit of humor into this to, but i think that this does help demystify um really what machine learning and uh, ai is really kind of all about and it truly is just a combination of uh algorithms and um statistics you probably maybe already have seen this one as well i thought this was pretty good so i've heard people kind of talk about uh you know, artificial intelligence, it's artificial intelligence when you're talking to the venture capitalists, it's machine learning when you're talk recruiting um, developers. And, uh, but it's just, it's just software. And there's um, a number of features that may be useful to a customer. And um, that's really kind of where it is. That being said, there's new techniques, there's new um, development practices and paradigms. And, um, that poses kind of a challenge to the traditional role of testing. And that was really what uh, woke me up and opened my eyes to this whole thing. And that's the whole reason why I want to um, uh, give this talk tonight. So I thought, okay, before I tell and share what I've done and what I think is going on, I have to kind of lay down some sort of a platform that we can have kind of a shared understanding of, of what we see this as. So, um, Yes, algorithms and statistics, glorified statistics, there's a number of ways of kind of like dismissing the mysticism around these technologies. Um, but it is really fascinating. Um, there's a set of processes that developers are now using in these fields where they're actually building new algorithms that will literally change themselves um, by learning from data. And um, which is really uh, interesting and um, hopefully that makes sense. So what do we mean by learning from data? Um, there's uh, sets of data, some training data that you train a model with and um, by using probability and multiple iterations, you can identify the more successful, more useful and applicable models that are going to um, you know, you know, be, uh, have higher success at providing some sort of value, some sort of feature to uh, something and then you can adopt that model and retrain and kind of iteratively um, improve it. So that's at the heart, I think that's like the best nutshell of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. 
And if that's not a great explainer for you, let me take us out of uh, the slide deck and I've got another video to show. Um, it's uh, very popular. It's already five years old. I can't believe this. And so you maybe you have seen this, but um, this, I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, let's dive in. Welcome back. Seth Bling here. You're watching a skilled player play Super Mario World, but this player is not human. It's a computer program I wrote called Mario. This program started out knowing absolutely nothing about Super Mario World or Super Nintendo's. In fact, it didn't even know that pressing right on the controller would make the player go towards the end of the level. It learned all of these things through a process called neuroevolution. In this video, I want to teach you about how Mario learned to beat this level, Donut Plains 1, what his brain looks like, and how it's all based on actual biological evolution. So let's start out by actually looking at Mario's brain. Let's play it again, but this time we'll look at Mario's brain as it's making the decisions of what buttons to press. It's going to look a bit complicated at first, but don't worry, I'll help break it down for you. This structure of colored lines and blinking boxes is called a neural network. It's a simple mathematical model for how a brain works, but it can produce some very complicated behavior. With enough computational power, a neural network could come close to simulating a real human brain, but modern technology isn't there yet. On the left side you have the inputs. This is what Mario sees. It's a simplified view of the level. The white squares stand for blocks the player can stand on, and the black squares stand for moving objects like enemies or mushrooms. On the right side, you have the outputs. These are the eight buttons that Mario is able to press by using its neural network. In between the inputs and the outputs, all those lines and boxes, those are the neural network. Each free-floating box is called a neuron, and the lines connecting those boxes are like the axons and dendrites in a human brain. At any given time, only some of these neurons and connections are actually being used, and this is what people talk about when they say you only use 10% of your brain. The neural network you're seeing is a pretty complicated one, and it got so complicated as a result of a 24-hour evolutionary learning session. So, to explain how neural networks work, let's rewind about 24 hours and look at how the whole process started. This is what Mario looked like at the beginning of its training session, all the way back in generation number zero. The program is probably even dumber than you thought at this point. Often it just stands there and doesn't even press any buttons. If Mario stands still for too long, it'll cut off a simulation and try the next neural network, so it's mostly just jumping from one simulation to the next. But occasionally, the neural network says to press the right button, and the player starts walking right. The behavior isn't complicated, but it's enough to make at least some progress in the level. Let's take a look at a sample neural network to understand just how that works. This is one of the randomly generated neural networks that appeared in the first generation of the simulation. There are some green lines and a red line, and one neuron in the middle. Here's how it works. A green line is a positive connection, and a red line is a negative connection. A green line reading from a black or white square will turn its output the same color. A red line reading from a black or white square will turn its output the opposite color. In this case, the green lines read from the platform that the player is standing on, and make the neural network press the right button as long as the player is standing on it. However, when the red line reads a black square representing one of those caped Koopas, it presses the A button and makes the player jump. This, this puts the player in a position where the green lines are no longer reading a white square, so the right button turns off and Mario just stands there. This is a really basic example that illustrates how a more complicated neural network might operate. The more lines and neurons you have, the more nuanced the decisions can be. So, how exactly do we get those more complicated neural networks? The answer is evolution. When Mario gets further right on the screen, its fitness goes up. In this case, fitness is a function of how far right it gets and how quickly it gets there. Only the neural networks that produce the highest fitness are selected to be bred, creating the next generation. It took 34 generations of genetic breeding and fitness evaluation before Mario was able to finish the level without dying and get a fitness score above 4,000. You can see there were several places it got stuck for a few generations, but it always evolved out of those ruts. Let's take a look at a few of those ruts. You can look at the top left corner of the screen to see what generation number each rut occurred on. This process of picking the fittest individuals from each generation, breeding them together, and adding random mutations very closely matches the actual process of biological evolution that took single-celled organisms and produced intelligent humans. That's the power of neuroevolution. And though we don't yet have enough computational resources to produce something on the level of the human brain this way, 
it's kind of neat to see what it can do on one of my favorite games. I didn't come up with this idea on my own. This algorithm is called NEAT, which stands for Neuro Evolution of Augmenting Topologies. And it's based on a paper by Kenneth Stanley and Risto Mikulainen. It's a really great paper that described how to use genetic algorithms to build up neural networks from bare bones without presupposing the best structure for the neurons and their connections. It also includes some really cool ideas for separating genomes into species, which a lot of genetic algorithms don't really try and do. I wrote Mar.io from scratch in Lua as a plugin for an emulator called Bizhawk. As I close out the video, let's take a look at the fittest neural network in each generation. It's kind of cool how sometimes you can see them make modifications to each other and improve performance, but sometimes an entirely new species becomes prominent and dominates the others. If you'd like to do more reading about the concepts I talked about in this video, I provided some links in the video description. I had a lot of fun okay. working on this project and I learned a ton. Hopefully you learned something too. That ought to do. Um, isn't that cool? I just am just blown away by this stuff. It's, it's, I love it. Um, so as you can see, I think that really helps. It helped me a lot to really understand how machine learning is going to improve a system. A developer may, may not know the answer. They may not know exactly how to program the performance of a video game, right? But they're going to start with nothing. And the fact that it has a very clear defined success criteria with that fitness that he described going further to the right and going faster in time, um, it's able to produce um, more and more effective uh, generations. So it really makes a lot of sense. What really struck me is it's not necessarily the best, most optimal method of passing through that level in that game. It's just at every step, at every generation that uh, the model is um, learning, it's just what was better than the last iteration. Um, and so we definitely see that a lot in, uh, in machine learning. And so um, it's very highly probability related. Uh, you probably already know some of these examples, but you know, we've already had AI um, in our lives for a long time. It's not necessarily just something um, really kind of like game changing like Alexa, but even just Google PageRank or just recommendation systems for Netflix or Amazon are things that we've already dealt with for uh, many years. I think one of the key concepts that's going on here is um, they are, this is software that is not intrinsically providing the right answer, right? It's giving you a list like this is most likely going to be the right answer for the most number of people based on this search criteria, based on this search behavior, this purchase behavior, um, but it may not be. And uh, behind the top recommendations, there's going to be more recommendations. And based on that, that is the data that a machine learning system can use uh, to learn further. And so as I mentioned, uh, probability is a big part of it. Um, and so we, what we have, how can I say this? Um, in the project that I worked on, I was introduced to non-deterministic uh, computing. Um, it doesn't always produce the same result. And a lot of, you know, basically of all the computer computation, all the computer science and, and uh, programming that's happened really up until now, um, is really kind of geared toward just producing a function that's going, and in fact, we would test for that. We, that's a measure of quality that it is going to be consistent. It is going to produce uh, the same result over and over again. Um, but quantum computing, actually, because of the superposition of the qubits, um, it's not always going to produce a consistent result. And I was kind of shocked to realize that that's something that we can use to actually solve problems that deterministic computing couldn't solve. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, quantum superiority, that um, the thing is, it can solve things that deterministic computing can't, but it can't necessarily outperform um, regular transistor uh, classical computation faster. 
So they're really kind of like two paradigms that are built for, um, for different things. And I'm going to get into that in, uh, in just a little bit. Um, but so I probably should tell you a little bit more of our, uh, the project that I worked on. Um, you saw the video, we were the port of uh, Los Angeles and we were working on uh, some uh, optimization uh, for, the, um, for the yard. So with a ter shipping terminal, you've got the ships coming in and the containers come off the ships and they come into the United States either by rail or by truck. And for our uh, project, we're focused on truck because it was a highly inefficient system. Um, the uh, longshoremen, they are highly, very costly uh, labor. There's five uh, individuals that work on every one of those cranes. And so um, if they had to pull multiple containers out of the way just to get to the right container, uh, which you can think of like just similar to um, Google results, what it takes to achieve the right result. Um, it was highly, co it was very costly. And so um, what we really wanted was for them, for the trucks to come in and to be able to uh, just pick up the container that was going to be, um, take the least amount of work to uh, achieve. Well, unfortunately, uh, the relationships between the trucking companies and the shipping lines and the cargo owners like Amazon, Target, and Walmart, <clears throat> excuse me, wouldn't really allow for that. And so um, the trucks were required to come in within a certain window. They had to make an appointment. And so um, we built an appointment system that did um, appointment suggestions and also predicted when the next uh, set of containers are going, most likely going to become uh, available for um, pickup using the least amount of um, crane moves. And so that was a really difficult problem to solve because a lot of people had a lot of opinions about how to optimize um, these operations. And how do you know which one is correct? How do you know what's right or wrong and so um, what we decided to do was use the D-Wave system, quantum annealing, uh, to use the qubits to test and evaluate the competing algorithms or the optimization strategies and to find the ground truth. And, and so we identified, you know, this is the optimization strategy that is uh, absolutely going to have higher probability and consistently providing a higher level of optimization than some of the other strategies. Um, so I can't get into it uh, too much more than that without, uh, you know, revealing the secret sauce, but um, it was very interesting stuff. And so um, I want to pull back and describe like my understanding of these two different paradigms. And hopefully this will make a lot of sense to you guys if you've worked in the ter deterministic computation um, over the past, you know, what, 70, 80 years, I think all of us have uh, traditional programming. Most of the uh, software that is written, there's going to be a method, there's going to be an algorithm, there's going to be a program and is written to perform, to perform a specific function. And um, software is highly complex. And so there's been this traditional role of testing that a lot of us are familiar with. And you come in and you evaluate the fitness of the software to consistently perform that function and provide the result to a uh, specific user, specific customer that they're going to be uh, familiar with. And so something about that is it implies an expected result. Um, we don't always necessarily know the expected result, but usually we have a pretty good idea. So very often um, the expected result is defined ahead of time, um, but then there is uh, there's some room for exploratory testing where you just kind of try some things empirically, see what the result is, and then kind of evaluate it at that point. But um, if you're going to do such an exercise, it's kind of incumbent on you to have enough knowledge to be able to make, you know, to render a judgment on, on how fit something like that is. And so that's really kind of like the paradigm that I think most of us are used to. Um, 
in the last talk that I came where I talked about reporting up in an agile world and applying the, some of the agile project management principles, um, I made a central point, and, I, and actually John Bach made this point um, as well, uh, and actually back in 2014, Robert Musson from Microsoft, chief data scientist, made the same point um, at a QA SIG back then. So this is at least the uh, fourth time that this has come up in QA SIG that um, a lot of us from the testing world are used to the verb test as being basically the central purpose to our job and role and our contribution to an organization. And now a number of us are saying, actually, we contend that uh, the central purpose is to gather information. Testing will produce results. You can make your observations, you can make your judgments. All of that is um, information for the organization to make a judgment on the fitness of releasing a product. Um, but there's more than that. There's, you know, okay, there are bug counts. You can, um, produce a number of quality related metrics, uh, agile metrics such as velocity, and provide the organization with information so that the, inf uh, for, so the organization can render uh, a judgment or make a decision. And that's what I think um, this paradigm has really matured into, is this role has been all about gathering information. Well, um, I pulled this specifically from uh, a white paper, one of a few white papers that I read about testing machine learning systems um, that really laid it out that they are difficult to test because they are designed most of the time to provide an answer to a question for which no previous answer exists. So that's really one of the most challenging things about how do you test and what is the role of a tester um, within uh, machine learning uh, development. And so compared to the deterministic computation program, this is my base, best understanding of the non-deterministic computation paradigm um, where things are based on probability and it's not expected to always provide um, uh, a consistent result or the right result, but is going to uh, predict produce the most likely right result the most uh, frequent number of times. And what I've really realized is uh, the machine learning programs themselves are actually gathering information. When they are um, being fed the training data and when you select the best model uh, the candidate model to proceed to the next generation of, of the model. That is all based on information. It's essentially a testing exercise itself. And so um, that raised this question that I was just thinking about a lot, like what exactly is this role of testing in AI, ML, and quantum computing? And I realized the development of machine learning systems sort of is testing itself. Um, building these models involves a lot of testing. And that does not necessarily mean that there are no tester roles, um, but it became clear that the skill set is based more on data science than like the epistemology that maybe a lot of us are, um, are used to. And so um, let me go back to my little diagram here and just add uh, an additional arrow at the bottom and just kind of to establish that this is a, a fairly iterative process. And so you're not going to have your, uh, your optimal results within one generation, but um, as we see from the MAR-IO example, um, it really becomes a very impressive thing um, and really kind of surpasses really what humans are even able to do. So let me describe some of the um, details about what uh, testing in the machine learning world looks like. Um, the process of building a model uh, involves training, using data. You may already know this. Um, and one of the most standard practices is going to be to take a data set and to split it into three chunks. There's going to be some training data, and then there's going to be some validation data, and then some testing data itself. And um, the reason that those are different is um, 
because you can take a model and feed it some training data and it's going to change and evolve as we saw with the Mario example. Okay, great, but is it right or is it good or is it useful? That is another question that um, is difficult to answer and uh, the, you know, the output, the results of these things is not always going to be very clear. And so that's what the testing data is going to be um, is going to be for. So if you think back to that Mario example, the little video game, um, we've got this random distribution of all the outcomes, but because we had um, some uh, pretty simple success criteria, um, the ones with the strongest fitness were actually kept, the others were, were dismissed, and then that was built upon. And so that's really kind of um, how it worked. And so the question then is posed, okay, but like, what about bugs? What about like the traditional activities that a software tester may do? Well, that program actually found undiscovered bugs in Super Mario Brothers. These had existed for decades, uh, but were never found by humans. And so um, that really kind of blew my mind and that really kind of underscores and exemplifies how these systems are actually going to be useful as testing techniques and validation techniques um, to maybe to find bugs or to assure quality, but more accurately to gather information. Um, or when uh, people are trying to ideate, what is the best optimization strategy? What is the best uh, efficiency um, for a given system, such as uh, supply chain uh, logistics? You apply some machine learning and it's going to come up with an answer um, that is, has a lot more substantiation to it, I think, than um, just something we could come up with off the top of our heads. So that's really kind of like my main thesis is that uh, machine learning sort of is testing. And, um, you know, we can use it to make predictions. But all of these are essentially testing activities. But there is still a role for testers. And um, so some of the traditional things that we do um, is going to be applicable. And so where exactly do you test in a machine learning system? There's really kind of three components to a machine learning system. There is the data itself, um, there is the learning program, and then the underlying framework, um, which usually pulls from a lot of existing ML libraries um, uh, to make it actually function. And so definitely one of the biggest and most important activities is to validate the data because um, nobody likes garbage, and so, um, you know, there's definitely a, a high risk there of the program taking off and building some sort of um, program or, you know, algorithm that's actually not going to fit a real world scenario very well just because you have really poor data or there are flaws or bugs in the data. Maybe the data uh, itself, it may be the schema of the data. And so that is one of the uh, most important activities is validating the data. Um, you also need to validate the model as well. There's a number of um, processes and activities that uh, can be used to uh, validate models. And then at every stage, you're going to evaluate the results uh, for the accuracy. Are there uh, po false positives or false negatives? That's always been a big thing in software testing in general. Um, underfitting or overfitting is when uh, a machine learning model can be trained too closely to the training data. So you use the training data and it looks like it's performing fantastically. And then you give it real world data that's not training data and um, it's not going to perform well at all. And so um, that's the purpose of the, um, the validation data and the test data as well, is to use that to kind of evaluate. So that's like kind of like a meta uh, false positive. And, um, and so you want to identify spurious correlations as well in these results. It may look correct. Um, this is 
really kind of a difficult territory to evaluate because if you are working with things that are answering questions for which there has been no answer before, then you don't know what is correct. You don't have an expected result um, to compare against. And so um, that's definitely difficult. And that's why I uh, emphasized earlier that I think that really kind of um, constitutes a, uh, a data science background or a data science skill set a little bit more than kind of like the epistemological um, predicate that most uh, software testing has been based on up until now. Um, but there's more to it than that. I'd say it's very important to understand the questions that are being asked, the questions that um, the machine learning program is built to answer. Um, so I mentioned the success criteria, the, the Mario game, that's kind of easy. You, you, you know, you pass the level, you, you don't die. You keep on moving forward to the right. You do it as quickly as you can. That's easy success criteria. A lot of the questions that are being asked of machine learning programs are um, more difficult than that, or they may be fairly simple questions conceptually, but to answer them or to evaluate um, the candidate answers to those questions, that is, uh, that's very difficult. And so, um, basically, it doesn't matter who's doing the job, whether it's a tester or just another developer on the team, um, it's important to distinguish between the unexpected and the incorrect. It may be unexpected, but does that mean it's wrong? Can't, can't answer that right now without you know, a real world example. So um, you gotta know what questions the testing can solve and what questions uh, or what problems testing cannot solve. Um, with traditional testing, you know, we can figure out how to generate inputs that are going to trigger the chunks of logic to undercover the bugs. That was actually one of the most challenging things on uh, the Port of LA project. Um, how to identify errors in the results. But there are some things that testing can't solve. And so, um, like I said, those optimization pr problems, how do you identify what is the correct optimization strategy or sampling problems? And so um, what we used was uh, we built a simulation to represent um, or a model to, to represent um, everything going on in the operations of the terminal. And against that, we built a digital twin. And digital twin is also a model as designed to represent something as closely as possible. And then all of the properties and all of the variables and all of these pieces of the digital twin can then be changed basically as variables. And, um, and then you run it through the simulation and um, you may get good results or bad results, but you may get different results and you can understand um, the importance and the nature of those properties of uh, the underlying uh, real world system that you are modeling. And so um, a digital twin is a huge part of um, machine learning testing. And so you can test different configurations for performance and optimization and uh, all of these things. And basically, I would say, well, this stuff takes a lot of work and you can read the screen just as much as I can. Um, there's a lot that goes on in this world that is new in the non-deterministic com computation world. Um, so it's stuff that developers weren't doing and stuff that testers weren't doing. Um, and all of this is not really what I would call, you know, the coding of the learning program, the algorithms or the machine learning framework. Um, so requirements analysis, asking the right questions, defining success criteria, all of these things, generating the data all the way down the list. Um, there's a non-developer role here, uh, but it's requires a lot of specialization in the skill set. It requires a lot of data science understanding and not as much of the uh, traditional um, test skill set that have gotten people jobs before. Obviously, you know, mobile, uh, 
uh, cloud computing, AWS, uh, platform work, all of these things, they are not going away. Embedded uh, application development, that is not going away anytime soon. Internet of Things has taken off. Um, this is not changing the tech world that we have been operating in, but it's opening up a new field. And um, I'm sure the universities and a lot of the, the, um, the courses out there are teaching people very well. But for the people who have been in the industry, like myself and most of my colleagues for most of my career, um, this is very new. It, it's very orthogonal. It's, it's a different uh, world than what we're used to. And um, there's not a lot of people doing it. There's going to be increased and increased demand uh, for this skill set. And so um, what I hope is that uh, people are going to take this talk and kind of understand how um, there's a lot of opportunity to, to build onto it. Um, it's still very new. And, uh, and so, yeah, like I said, there's a lot of opportunity and that's basically um, my point for the talk. And uh, that's it. My name is Jacob. And uh, so thanks for your time. And I'm going to turn it over to the uh, Q&A now. Okay, on the Q&A, remember folks, you can type your questions in, uh, you can ask in chat, or we can take you off mute and you can ask Jacob directly. You packed a lot of stuff in there, so I'm guessing that there's probably a question or two floating around there, uh, out there. So uh, feel free to, uh, uh, to either put your questions in or request that you are removed from uh, mute and we will let you talk directly to Jacob. Super outstanding talk, Jacob. Thank you. Fascinating and it went full of graphics and everything else. It was just so much fun, you know, and we've been doing this for 19 years and that was a, an excellent talk. John, thank you for taking on the, uh, the PM today. I hope some of you guys uh, participate in that. We don't have a drawing this week, <laughs> obviously, but thank you all for joining. Thank you very much and participate in the, the QA after. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I appreciate that. <coughs> Thanks very much. Again, Jacob, thanks a lot. You know, uh, it was asked earlier if you were going to be able to share your PowerPoint out. Are you going to? Yeah, yeah, sure. Happy to. Yeah, I'll turn that over to you guys and you can pass it on to the participants. Okay. Uh, okay, we've got a couple of questions that have popped up. Uh, you talked a lot about the MLAI. What was unique about testing something with uh, quantum involved? Okay, yeah. So the quantum annealing um, process was very interesting. Basically, uh, we had a number of ideas on how to um, optimize the yard, optimize throughput, optimize crane op uh, uh, operations, and uh, the best ways to have trucks come up and, and pick up containers um, and, you know, uh, use of scheduling and appointing, what is going to be the way that we um, do all these. Though uh, the machine learning developers were able to distill those down to basically um, mathematical questions. And so quantum annealing was the use of the D-Wave uh, quantum system. Um, gosh, I should, probably should have dug into that a little bit more and because uh, off the top of my head it's really kind of difficult because like there's the famous you know Richard Feynman quote that you know if you think that you understand quantum mechanics then you don't understand quantum mechanics um, but if you're familiar with the concept of superposition you know watching uh, the Avengers and all sorts of uh, sci-fi um, movies nowadays um, we've got you know the the multiverse and all these kind of concepts is, is based on the fact that um, every single quantum particle is in a superposition of, of it's, it's in multiple states at, at once. And then when the idea is the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics is when you observe 
um, uh, a particle that it is forced to choose one of those states. And what D-Wave and Google have been able to do with quantum computing is they're able to store information inside a, a single quantum particle so that when you check, it is going to be, is going to become one of those states. And so, you know, in uh, information science, we've got, um, you know, the purest form of information is going to be binary, on and off, one and a zero. And so you're going to have a qubit. It's going to be one or the other. And um, by using quantum annealing, basically the f there's a fact of all of physics where any given physical system wants to f reach the lowest energy state. <laughs> I'm kind of I'm kind of struggling with kind of put, putting in this into words because I have uh, at best a loose uh, grasp and understanding of this stuff. It's very dense and difficult to understand. But um, a quantum system or any physical system wants to get itself into a lowest energy state. And so what the quantum systems are able to do is they slowly add more energy into a quantum state and um, it will help to find uh, a ground truth. And the way it does that is <laughs> difficult and actually kind of a little bit beyond my grasp. But what we have as a result of that is, is um, I guess kind of mathematically, it's called the, uh, it's, it's an energy reduction model. So let me put it this way. When you've got a whole bunch of metal, all these containers coming through the yard and, and you've got a certain amount of throughput, you can kind of mathematically define your optimization strategies, which I guess another way of saying optimization strategy is how do you let all those containers move through the yard? And when you do that at these large scale simula simulations of hundreds of thousands and, and millions over however much time you want to define, um, you are able to see with very much, very high probability, very good certainty, um, how much energy usage is, is fundamentally going to be there, if that makes any sense, um, by leveraging this, this desire of the system to get into a lower energy state. And so when you find the lowest energy state that corresponds to one of the um, optimization strategies, then we can say, okay, um, well, that's what we're going to use. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, I've got a few more out here for you. Uh, Beth asks, uh, you've talked about the opportunities in this new area of development. What course of study or training would you recommend to prepare for these opportunities? Oh, gosh, yeah. You know, I wish I had a good answer to that one. I did not do any homework on, you know, Coursera or um, uh, Linda or any of the um, programs that are out there. Um, there are likely some, uh, some tutorials for free. There's definitely some white papers. Um, that are a little bit dense. Um, and then there's kind of like even, you know, like X for Dummies, that, uh, that famous series of books and, and um, um, content online, they actually do have some fairly good quantum computing um, resources as well. So look, check out dummies.com and, and, and search there. And they've got some articles. Um, so I don't know, just kind of research and, and click around. I'm kind of self-taught, but I mean, to be honest, I stumbled into this. Kind of, I, I, my role was a, a quality consultant and a project management consultant because that was kind of the stuff I, I knew and you know the port we're, we're just looking for extra firepower on on that side of things so if they were looking for you know additional machine learning developers then I would not they would not have called my name that's for sure and this kind of dovetails into that one another question was uh, what are other good learning uh, for ML AI testing, aside from data science, statistics, and neural networks? Um, 
You know, so may, maybe what I'll do, I'll add another slide before I share it. I'm going to look through um, the tabs. I had like maybe 50 tabs open and just preparing for this call just to make sure that I didn't, you know, like completely talk out my rear and, and say anything stupid because I had, you know, my understanding. But, you know, I, I mean, this is not like a college level course on um, quantum mechanics or uh, machine learning by any means. Um, but some of the stuff that I did find were actually really easy to follow along um, examples. And so if you have even like the very basic, like beginner level of Python aptitude, um, you've got a Mac or a Windows or a Linux system, you can install a number of packages on there and um, just follow step by step. And you're able to do some, some very cool things. One of the, actually, I was thinking about including, I decided I was gonna uh, cut it out, but there is a, um, a really easy tutorial that I stepped through and they used um, a table of data to program a system into predicting like some very simple calculations and, and what really blew me away is like it looks like arithmetic it looks like it's just performing calculations like if you take a very simple simple pattern a lot of us know that you know our brains um, biologically are built to um, do a lot of pattern recognition and we have a lot of false positives and, and false negatives and people compare that very often to uh, computers right and computer science so you take something very simple like say like you know a plus b plus c or a times one plus b times two plus c times three and then you give a an, an answer and you train a system and you can actually step through with a debugger like i did if you're actually kind of doubtful on this because what is going on is it's not actually using arithmetic. The system did not actually calculate those values and perform an addition to reach a sum. It actually used prediction to predict what the answer was going to be and, and instantly had like 100% um, success. So uh, it's, it's really remarkable stuff. So I'll, I'll put together a, a little list uh, of what I've got, but I would just encourage people just to kind of um, search around. I think that's kind of one of the cool things, you know, about YouTube and the web and the world that we're living in. And, and you know, now we're reaching the middle of the of the 21st century is very different from even like a decade ago, where all the knowledge was really kind of like needing to be taught to you from the university system. But um, there's just so many resources out there and so many of them are free. So, you know, go for it. And I think this kind of ties into it. A lot of these questions are similar. And it says, did you find that there are techniques, processes, or tools to uh, assist verifying data used in training? So, yes. And I, I wasn't sure how specific to get into some of these details. I was trying to abstract it to I thought what were ne not necessarily practical tips, but just kind of helping people to understand um, the principles of, of what's going on. So I identified, you know, you've got these three basic components to a machine learning system, which is the data itself. And then you've got the learning program, you've got the underlying framework. And so there is a role to test for defects and errors within each of those things. And one of the most important ones, as I said, is um, to validate the data. I, in my specific scenario and experience just coming in with, I was not assigned the role of testing and validating the data. That was actually the job of um, the development team themselves. Um, but I was just helping to um, ensure that these things were happening and being planned out. And I just found it very fascinating. So that's why I dug into this stuff and did my research and had some interesting conversations with some of the, the researchers. So I don't actually have um, any good tips or, or details about that. I just know that, um, and also I can't reveal too much about, um, you know, I'm an under NDA about this program that we built, but, um, I just know what we were faced with was uh, large amounts of data and um, some very specific questions that our programs were designed to answer. And, um, and 
we just did the best that we could to kind of poke it with a lot of sticks and to come up with um, um, challenging ways to, uh, yeah, well, ways to challenge this system to help ensure that it is truly producing the most optimal result, basically. Okay, uh, and Priya asks, uh, uh, is there, or, or will testing or the test role involve or mean building a model to test a model? Will testing involve building a model in order to test a model? So yes, that's, and, and so that is intrinsically like a very necessary part of um, building a machine learning system. And that's really kind of like my central thesis is that it's, it's fundamentally a testing activity. And so I think that there's a lot of room, there's a lot of um, things that a lot of us can do to get involved in um, organizations and, and teams that are, that are building these programs. Um, and it's, it really can't be separated for like, there's not like, there's not somebody doing some coding and somebody doing some testing. It, it, even if there's going to be multiple people on a team uh, as there were uh, for us to be building this, um, it's fundamentally a knowledge gathering experimental and uh, empirical exercise that is going on. You're using humans, you're using strategies, and you know it's going to uh, be distilled into a into a learning program, and somebody is going to to code that out. But it is you know fundamentally it's a knowledge gathering and um, it, it, it's a testing activity is what it is. So John was curious to know that on that complex project, uh, what surprised you and how quote easy it was. Oh, gosh, you know, I was so kind of bewildered on the complexity of it all. I've almost kind of lost sight of what maybe um, was easy. I, I would get, I guess I would say, you know, it was, it's such a complex and even still fairly intimidating system. And I kept raising this question, okay, but how do we know it works? how do we know that the result is correct? And, you know, early on, they kind of tell me like, well, we don't have the answer, but really this is kind of what machine learning does. It is helping us to arrive at that answer, at what the best um, method or strategy uh, or optimization um, is going to be. And, you know, I, come from this, uh, I'm a tester, I'm skeptical. I'm like, oh, my job is fairly adversarial. I'm, you know, like a, like a prosecuting attorney or something. I am trying to prove it wrong. And ultimately, if I can't prove it wrong, then, it's, then it, it wins and like, that's great. But, you know, it's kind of like the Socratic method um, in effect. And so I guess the thing that is surprising about how easy these things are is how it is able to reach um, a, a, a correct answer, I would say. I would distinguish that from the correct answer. Um, again, if we look back to the, the MARIO program, it just needs to pass that level. It just needs to not die. And when you take all of the iterations and all of the generations that the model produced, there were some that are better than others. And you could you know, use some criteria to rank them and there's going to be like the best one. And that's what, um, uh, what Seth showed in his video. It's, it successfully passes, it does not die, it gets all the way to the end and it does it the fastest. And so that's fantastic. That is the number one ranked um, uh, model out of all that were that were produced. Is that the best of all time? Is that the best absolute most optimized um, way to pass that level in Mario Brothers? Not necessarily, like we don't even have the answer to that. In fact, I pretty much, uh, I, I, I would doubt that. Um, but if that's your objective is just to pass the level without dying, and then within the number of uh, uh, models that 
actually succeed, then you just pick the, the fastest one, then you've achieved your objective. And that's really kind of what it is. It's kind of like, it's, it's, it's an answer that is good enough, not necessarily the best. Gotcha. Uh, um, I don't think I've asked you this, but I, this one from Priya as well. Uh, how is it decided how much training, validation, test data is enough to ensure quality? And uh, how, is quality uh, how quality is ensured when uh, ex expected result is implied but not exact? Could this lack the ex exactness in the AI uh, and lead to high risk bug leakage? Right, let's see. Okay, so how much is enough? Um, I have kind of a couple answers to that, but I think the, the best takeaway this is not, I'm not necessarily answering that question specifically, but I think the first thing I would say is the best takeaway is knowing to, um, if you have a sufficient amount of data to break it up into uh, a training set and a validation set and um, a testing set. And actually, I wonder if I should go back and, and share my screen. It might not really be worth it right now, but there's a, um, a diagram here for those three steps to train, to validate, and, and, the, and then to evaluate. And once the training is completed, then you actually validate that the model is correct and, and, and accurate. And then at that, after that, then you actually evaluate um, the fitness of uh, the different models to, to be able to pick the best one, which one had the least uh, lowest error rate and the highest uh, accuracy or the highest, you know, fitness according to whatever success criteria you have. And so I guess you just have to have a sufficient amount of data and when you ask that question of how much is enough, I think that's really kind of a question for statistics and randomness. Um, say when you see um, if, in, a, in a sample set that is sufficiently random, and I'm not like a mathematician or anything, but I, I've, I've come across this and, and uh, recognized it to be true. Um, really even like a sample of about 5% of an entire data set, if it's sufficiently random, even like 5% is more than enough, like way more than enough to be able to produce um, a very uh, confident answer. And like, for example, we see a lot of that in politics. We will see 1% um, or a couple percent of precincts reporting for a state when everybody's up at night watching the presidential election results. And um, well, how often do you see them say, well, actually we have to call it for the other, you know, they call the state. Well, how often does that turn out to be wrong? It's actually very rare that that turns out to be wrong. And so we're dealing with, you know, with one or 2% precincts reporting with a given state, you know, we're dealing with, um, maybe tens of thousands of people for most of these states may even, you know, get into a, a few million. So, you know, it kind of depends on which state we're talking about, uh, of, of course, for the size, but the, that principle actually applies. Um, so it depends on the quality of data, but in order to reach a sufficient amount, um, it's actually kind of surprising that, uh, that you may not need as much as, as you think. I don't know if that's, necessarily a good answer to give you confidence that like this is always definitely enough um, but if there's enough it's really more about splitting the data up into training and um, testing data and um, and then validating that your data is sufficient like if you I mean, you'll probably know if you if you have doubts if you've got a really small sample set of of something you know you've got an excel spreadsheet with like 20 or 30 lines like okay maybe you're um, kind of in danger of having a uh, an overly small sample set, but beyond that, um, you're probably fine. Okay. 
I don't want to shortchange anybody, so please send the question, uh, send your questions in. I also want to be respectful for uh, with everyone's time, but I do have one more question for you, and you're going to need to look into your crystal ball a little bit on this one. But as quantum computers grow in their processing power, are there any opportunity spaces that are currently out of reach that may be possible in the future? Oh, <laughs> gosh, I don't think I'm going to have a very good answer for that. I am not like a very good futurist that, you know, Google and Microsoft, they employ these people and they'll talk about these visions for the future. And I read it and I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds very plausible. Like, OK, that's probably. But actually, you know, doing some of this this work and becoming a little bit more acquainted with statistics and stochastic um, uh, processes which are really randomly defined things I've come to have a much better appreciation about of of probabilities and so when I think of the future just to kind of make it a little bit philosophical or whatever I I don't believe many things are very strictly defined or I don't you may be aware of um, like in systems theory there are these concepts of uh, emergence um, uh, emergent behavior. So within a complex system, there's going to be um, these results. Well, I'll try to be a little bit sensitive about it. Probably the best example that I can think of is um, when people talk about uh, systemic racism. That is what what people see as a result of a complex system and they see it as an in inevitable result of that complex system and therefore they believe that the system needs to change. Um, totally that um, makes sense, right? Well, I see things in terms of probabilities, how it's not that a system is going to inevitably produce um, a, a clear result with certainty, but I think there's a probability that it's going to turn out like that. And there's just a number of unknown variables and factors that are going to build a turn. So really, I think that's a jumbled mess of an answer and my, I, my apologies, but I just, I don't even know how to, how to predict. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough yeah. one. The crystal, yeah. the crystal ball ones are challenging. Well, thank you so much for your time and presentation and everyone out there. Please do send additional questions in if you have them. I will make sure that they get to Jacob and that they get answered. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody for uh, joining us tonight and look forward to seeing you at the, uh, the first PM SIG uh, next month. Yeah, thanks everyone. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, have, have shared uh, the little that I know. <laughs> Oh, man. Thank you so much, Jacob. Appreciate it. Yes, sir.